Okay, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in amma ba'd This is the final class of our seminar It's a vital challenge for me today uh, We need to finish the entire seminar We need to finish one of the longest hadith in Sahih Bukhari This is the last hadith we need to do iftar, we need to break from Maghrib, and we need to say farewell to everyone, all in one class. Bismillah. So let us begin. We have exactly half hour before we break. Um, we need a reader who wants to read. We'll begin with reading hadith today. Shalom. Uh, no, I mean, you can put simultaneously along with Ibn Abbas. So any volunteers to read? Bismillah. Reading Arabic? Um, yes, Arabic. That's what reading is, Arabic. Do you have the Arabic? Because I don't have it on this. Actually, I do. Okay. So we're just going to read this nod and up to the third line, inshallah. And then we'll do the hadith after Maghrib. So he's supposed to say bi-isnadika al-mutasila ila al-musannifi rahimahullah qal. Now you read. Haddathana Abu al-Yaman al-Hakamu al-Nafi'a qala akhbarana shu'i an'ana al-Zuhri qala akhbarani hubaydullah ibn Abdullah Ibn Abdullah Ibn Abdullah Ibn Abbas Ibn Abbas Ibn Abbas Ibn Abbas Ibn Abbas Ibn Abbas Ibn Okay, that's good. Stop here. So this is not chart. What does it look like? So you can see many of the names are the same. Um, Brother Mohsen put the chart, the is not chart on the board. Um, but those who are reading online, you can read the is not. It's the same is not as yesterday at the uh, origins. So you have Zuhri from Ubaidullah Ibn Abdullah Ibn Utbah. He was one of the seven jurists of Medina from Ibn Abbas. And Ibn Abbas relates this very long hadith. So up until there is the same, but now we need to deal with two names here. So let's start with Shu'aib. So Zuhri, we had quite a bit of discussion yesterday about Zuhri, the great prolific Tabari, um, who's so central to hadith narration. And we mentioned, we talked about him at some length in many, many classes. So um, we did mention that Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah and Imam Malik likewise before him, they, for every great teacher, every great musnad, every great person in the chain, to get their hadith, they look for the best uh, students of those teachers. So it's not just anyone who relates from Zuhri, but they are looking for every teacher who are the top students. Um, so for professional teachers like Zuhri, someone who's massive, someone who's teaching thousands of students, people like Sufyan ibn Uyayna, Zuhri, Imam Malik, these professional teachers, the uh, methodology of Ahl al-Hadith is to go for their top teachers. Because when you have a professional teacher, you teach tens of thousands of people. So if you have, and I alluded to this earlier, Sufyan ibn Uyayna or Zuhri is teaching a Hadith, and only one person in the world relates a certain hadith from Zuhri or Sufyan, someone who had thousands of students. Where are the other thousands of students? So in that sense, it makes perfect sense. You have prolific teachers, you look for their top students and you look for corroboration. So Shu'aib is a student of Zuhri that Imam Bukhari goes for. Um, so Shu'aib is a great, uh, one of the great students of Imam Zuhri. So Imam Zuhri has um, 
thousands of students, but there are six top students for our purposes, okay? So the six top tier students of Imam Zuhri are the following. And I have that on the board, uh, online students. Give me one moment. This is the hadith and, okay. So, so Imam Zuhri is known to have six top tier students. The best of his students that Imam Bukhari, Imam Muslim, and the early muhaddithin go for, and Imam Ahmad even, these are the following. So Imam Malik is the greatest. We talked about Imam Malik and the Muatta. His teacher was, his main teacher was Zuhri. So the best student of Imam Zuhri is uh, Imam Malik. So. What does that mean? Every time Imam al-Bukhari goes for a hadith of Zuhri, he'll prefer it being through the Muwatta of Imam Malik. So this is a general principle. So to relate the hadith of Zuhri, Imam bukhari always goes for Malik. Unless there's a reason otherwise, unless Malik does not relate that hadith, or there's a reason for him to go otherwise. The other top students of Zuhri are Sufyan ibn Uyayna, Sufyan ibn Uyayna, Uqayl, Yunus, Shu'ayb, and Ma'mar. We looked at most of these names. We did biographies on every single one of them, except for Shu'ayb, and that's the person in our Isnad today. So Shu'ayb is one of the six top students of Zuhri. Um, he was someone whose Zahabi says, a thiqa, al-mutqin, he's trustworthy. The grading of him, uh, their judgment of him is that he's reliable, mutqin, uh, Yahya ibn Ma'in says he's on the level of Yunus and Uqayl in the hadith of Zuhri um, because he used to write them down for the ruler Hisham ibn Abdul Malik. And Imam Ahmad says, so what's different about Shu'ayb among the students is Shu'ayb had, um, he used to write all the hadith of his teacher behind. He had, he was a scribe, he had beautiful handwriting, and he had left behind excellent books, excellent copies of books. So the hadith that he related from Zuhri are all transcribed from him, written down in an excellent way. So, and that teaches you that there are various ways of transmitting knowledge. He said that hearing is one, memorizing, also through way of preserving writing, kitaba. Also hadith was transmitted by writing as well, mukataba. So Imam Shu'aib ibn Abi Hamza, um, who died in the year 162, was one of the six top students of Zuhri, and he preserved his hadith in writing, in written form. So Imam Ahmad says that his reports from Zuhri are by, by way of dictation, transcribing, called imla. Um, so on his deathbed, Shu'aib ibn Abi Hamza, he called his son and all of the students, and some of his students, and brought out all his books. You know, he knew he was passing away. He had this great treasure. He had these books of Imam Zuhri that he painstakingly verified and wrote down in his life. So he gathered a group of people, including his family, and he said, look, these are yours now. And he gave all of them permission in Jaza to transmit on their behalf, on his behalf. Yeah. And he said that these books only contain the verified reports of Zuhri. Um, so they asked him, how do we relate these hadith from you then? He says, you can use Amba'ana, that I dictated them to you, or Akhbarana, that I informed you. So, you know, when you relate hadith from a teacher, it's Sami'atu or Akhbarana, Haddathana, there are various uh, conventions. Um, so, Shu'aib, on his deathbed, he gave his books to a select group of students. Among them was his son, and among them uh, was Abu Yaman, who was the teacher of Imam Bukhari. So the teacher of Imam Bukhari, Abu Yaman, who he's relating this hadith from, was present. He's among those that received the books of Shu'aib, which contained the hadith of Imam Zuhri. And he also said to them, if you don't want to do that, uh, the people that were present, you know, all of these hadith I read to my son, so you can relate the, um, all of them with your isnad through my son by reading to him, if you like. <laughs> So Shu'aib was one of the top students of Imam Zuhri. Um, so coming back to Imam Zuhri, to summarize, um, his six top students are the following, Imam Malik, Sufyan ibn Uyayna, Uqayl, 
Yunus, Shu'ayb, and Ma'mar. Imam Muslim, Imam Bukhari, whenever they go for reports of Imam Zuhri, they're looking for these students. And there are other students as well, like you have Salih bin Kaysan and others who also related from Zuhri. But generally, these are considered the top students of Imam Zuhri. Now, among those who is the best, Imam Malik for sure. So for Bukhari, Imam Malik is the top. And then, so he goes for that, has his preference. He always goes for Imam Malik's is now through, through Zuhri. But when he uses these others, sometimes, because the others are not as strong as Imam Malik, so even though they're top tier students. So remember we talked about Ma'mar yesterday. Um, we talked about some problems, potential problems with him. We talked about potential problems with Yunus and Al-Qail. So every, every transmitter has potential problems. Like no one's perfect. No one has, like, is without issues. The only one that wasn't criticized as a transmitter was who? Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak, yeah. Everyone else has some issues, you know. So like Ma'mar from the reports of Iraq, um, he's, not, he's not strong. The reports of Zuhri, he's relatively strong, but he's not as strong as Malik. And Sufyan ibn Uyayn is a great muhaddith, muhaddith of, of Mecca, the one who relates to hadith of Rahma. So he's a great teacher, but he's not as good as Malik from the reports of Zuhri. So, you know, these are sophisticated discussions. You have to compare and contrast names, and um, it's, it's, it's a very deep discussion. So people don't understand that. So Shu'aib is very reliable in its written form when he's uh, relating hadith from, um, from Zuhri. And those who relate from him, sometimes they made a distinction. Did you get these from the hadith of Shu'aib through his books, which were solid, or did you get them through another channel? So that being said, um, the student of uh, Shu'aib that Imam al-Bukhari relates from is Abu al-Yaman. Abu al-Yaman al-Hakam ibn Nafi' of Homs. He was one of the highest teachers of Bukhari. Because his teachers were people like Shu'aib and Ismail ibn Ayyad. That makes Bukhari linked to Zuhri just through one tier. Someone asked Imam Bukhari was a student of Zuhri. No. Zuhri was a teacher of Malik. How could Imam Bukhari be a student of Zuhri? So Zuhri was much earlier. Um, so Zuhri's, Zuhri is like a couple of generations before Imam Bukhari. But Bukhari is able to link through Zuhri through just two intermediaries. He is able to have teachers that are students of some of the top students of Zuhri. So a Muslim, for instance, uh, so Abu al-Yaman is a teacher of Bukhari, but not Muslim. So a Muslim, the same is not Muslim will report from Adarimi, from Abu al-Yaman, from Shu'aib, from Zuhri. So one generation, one link removed. That tells you how high Imam Bukhari was and renowned he was in gaining these teachers. Abu al-Yaman was born in the year 138. Um, so he was you know, from the students of Shu'aib. And who was, of, so among the students of Zuhri, the top one was Malik. Abu al-Yaman doesn't relate from Malik from Zuhri for some reason. So it's related in his life that he went to Imam Malik and there's something he didn't like about him, so he just left him. And then Imam Malik passed and he realized who he was later on, he regretted it. So this, this happens a lot. This is the second time I brought up an incident like that. People see things on behalf of other people, they judge them. And then they don't realize who they are, and then time passes, and they're full of regrets. So that happened with a number of people. A number of people missed out on, on, on great teachers just because of a specific flaw or something they judged to be a flaw. So that was the case with Abu al-Yaman. So his problem is that, you know, some people dispute the reports of Shuraib, um, but he received them through his books. Imam al Dhabi says that all his reports from Shu'aib are through Ijazah. And I related to you the incident of Shu'aib on his deathbed, where he said, you know, um, these are my books. They're verified, they're authentic. I've read all of them with Imam Zuhri, I've read all of them with my son, either relate them through my son, through me with the chain, or relate directly from my books, those who people were present. So he gave them permission to relate from his books. He handed the books physically to these students. Look, so is that a reliable way of transmission for Imam Bukhari? Yes. For others, they might have disagreed. No, he didn't actually read these hadith to him. You have to actually read them. But, um, but Imam Bukhari, his reasoning was, look, Shu'aib's books were solid. They were verified. And so many people relied on his books, his, like, his notes of the hadith of Zuhri. For him to give that to uh, Abu al-Yaman, 
and Abu al-Yaman to relate them, there's no problem because we know those hadith are solid. Um, and that's why Abu al-Yaman, when he relates uh, from Imam Shu'aib, he says, Akhbarana, or rather than Haddathana. Someone asked on the forum, what's the difference between Akhbarana and Haddathana? So that's used roughly interchangeably, but some people made a distinction. For instance, the hadith experts of North Africa, they made a distinction. For them, Haddathana was stronger. Haddathana is where you actually heard something. Um, but Akhbarana means to inform. So you, yes, Akhbarana means you got the hadith from the teacher, but it's a little more vague. Like, how did you actually get it? It could be through a book. It could be through some other means, through a jaza. Um, but you might not have actually heard it. So for Bukhari, it didn't make a difference. But for some people, they made a distinction. So in these forms, like, you look at it from this perspective, the strongest connection between Musnadin, between the transmitters, Ruat, is Samirtu. When someone says Samirtu, there, there's no doubt. When you say Samirtu, you can't say that when you receive the book or in a jaza or in... So Samirtu. And then number two after that, Haddathana or Haddathani. This person related to me, because that has a sense that it was, it was through, like, you know, hearing or reading to the teacher. And then number three is Akhbarani, Akhbarana. So Akhbarana means he informed. So in terms of strength, this is one way of looking at it. Samirtu, Haddathani, and Akhbarani in order of strength. Okay. Um, so Abu al-Yaman, they researched his reports from Zuhri, his hadith through Shu'aib to Zuhri. They only found one mistake. So people made a big deal about that one mistake. There was a name that was changed to Amran bin Hussein. So out of hundreds of reports, there was one famous report that he narrated, and it was a mistake. So Imam al-Bukhari investigated, and he realized what happened was uh, Abu al-Yaman had all the hadith of Shu'aib written down, and then followed them were the hadith of the other person, um, Imran bin Hussein. And so the last hadith of Zuhri, he mixed up and put in this section of Imran bin Hussein. So it's just an innocent mistake. So that doesn't affect the grading of the reporter overall or his hadith. Okay, so that's what I wanted to say about the students of Zuhri. So you have your Isnad chain in front of you. We are done with the Isnad. There's actually one more thing I wanted to share with you. So, there's a major printing blunder in two books here. This is the book that Ramjan wanted to buy. Like, he, he put the link for this book, and he said, can I buy this book? Um, so, this is the Dar es Salaam, one volume, Sahih Bukhari edition. It's on my shelf. And this is the famous Sahih Bukhari in English. Nine volumes from Dar es Salaam. So, something interesting here, if you open up these, and I just happened to see that, um, if you look at on the board, um, online students, one moment. It's a challenge. My cursor is not working today. Okay, so someone read from the top. Hadathana. Everyone to read together. Hadathana Abu Yaman. What does it say after that? Hadathana Al Hakam Ibn Nafir. So there's a Bukhari teacher is Abu Yaman, and he relates from Al Hakam Ibn Nafir. But that's one person. So Abu Yaman Al Hakam Ibn Nafir is one person. So in both of these, and it's not every single edition, but I have another Dar es Salaam that's all six books of Hadith in one volume. Uh, in there, it doesn't say that. So it just says, Hadathana Abu Yaman Al-Hakam Ibn Nafir. So you can see how in printing mistakes like this can happen. Um, and it happens, and these are books that people use today. So if you read like this particular version, you might, I mean, is it a huge deal? Yes and no. It is a huge deal. You made one person into two, and you created more links in the chain. Um, but this is a mistake that happens. So you can't always trust every book that you read. 
because mistakes like this happen. It's just a simple word that was inserted. That happened before. That used to happen in, from the earliest times. They're called uh, uh, the suhuf. Uh, when there is mistakes that happen, it's, it's called tasrif. Many, many examples I shared. What's the example I shared yesterday of tasrif? Very funny one. You know, on Jibreel, uh, on Rasulullah, on Jibreel, on Ilahi, on Rajulin. So just from like a, one of these mistakes in reading, someone made the chain going through the Prophet, through Jibreel, to Allah, through a man. Allah is relating from a man. Okay. Is it time to break the fast? Okay. So you have to, anyone who's fasting, feel free to break your fast while we finish up. So these are tasheef, like uh, printing mistakes. These are, um, or writing mistakes, or mistakes that happen, a spot of ink falls and creates a dot when there's no dot there, or vice versa. So these things happen all the time. So just be careful about addition. That's why having a reliable addition is very, very important. Um, so we have various reliable additions. Um, I also have, so this is, so I broke my back bringing this up the stairs. I did that for the first couple of weeks. And then yesterday, Asim Bai decides to show up in the last three classes and ask a question about manuscripts when I stopped bringing them. So I'm forced to bring it again. This is one of the earliest manuscripts we have of the Sahih from beginning to end, the entire Sahih. It's from the year 550. So it's about 200 years after Bukhari. So you can see it's very readable. It's uh, the entire thing exists. It's in a library in the Suleimania uh, complex in Istanbul. It was discovered recently. It's the version of Abu Dhar al-Harawi. And it goes back to 200 years within the lifetime of Imam al-Bukhari. It's still there. You can go touch it and read it. So what they did, they published it. Erdogan sponsored the publication. Um, so the entire manuscript is published. Uh, like this is a picture of it, obviously. It's not that original. So you can actually read it. So when I found this mistake, I looked it up in here, and it says, Hadathan uh, al-Hakam Abu al-Yaman al-Hakam ibn Nafir. That mistake is not there. That's where I realized, okay, something this early doesn't have it, that this must be a mistake. Um, so these things happen all the time. So when you have potential mistakes like that, you have to research, corroborate more, look into the books, look into other versions of the book, look into earlier manuscript. That's what scholars do. But if you want to, like, you know, well, if this is too complex for you, leave it to the scholars. What are you going to do when you buy this book from the shelf and you read it and you start making mistakes? So everyone needs to know about these things to some degree. Um, but just be, be aware that these things do happen. So that is the Isnad. We have five minutes. Any questions before we break from Maghrib? We'll do the Hadith um, after the break. No, um, not all of them from Medina. Uh, I think Abu Yaman is. What did I say? He's from Homs. Remember, I said he's from Homs. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, Shoaib. You're right. Shoaib. Shoaib. I mean, all of them were in Medina studying from Zuhri, but some of them were from other regions. They settled in Medina temporarily, spent some time, and then went back. So, you know, all of them, yes, they came to Medina, but whether they're originally from Medina, from like that region, um, most of them probably were not. They were coming from Yemen and different regions. Any other questions? Okay, let's take a break then. Um, exactly one hour break. We'll come back at 9.25 and continue inshallah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we'll go down and pray and then we'll come back upstairs. Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. <clears throat> Welcome back. A classroom full of full stomachs and sleepy eyes. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Okay, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So let us, uh, there's a couple of things to do. So let's read the hadith. It's uh, one of the longest hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari. Um, so let's read, let's have a reader, and we'll read, so we'll do it quickly. So we'll read line by line, we'll trans, I'll translate, and then we'll do a brief commentary. Um, that way we can finish the hadith, and then there are a couple of things left for al Jami or Sahih in the life of Imam al-Bukhari. So who has a mic, and who is going to read? I don't have the hadith on the board, so you're going to have to use your own Sahih al-Bukhari. This is the last class. Most of you should have copies by now. <laughs> any, any what? Okay, yeah, we need a fast reader, yeah. So why don't you take the mic? <laughs> okay. Well, I can't that fast. How long is it? Four pages, bro. Four pages. Four pages. Yeah, bro. Yeah. It's the whole story. <laughs> okay, Bismillah. Who, who's reading? Okay. Hurry up. Huh? Oh, now he's Bisnadik al Mutasila ila al Musannifi rahimahullah ta'ala qal. Mutasila ila al Musannifi qal. And then, and then he's qal. Okay. Okay, so just read from um, from we skipped a snad. Anna Sufyan ibn Harbin. Where's the mic? Is it working? Yeah. Okay. Anna Abu Sufyan ibn Harbin. أخبرهم أن هرقل أرسل إليه في ركب من قريش وكانوا تجارا بالشام. بالشام. But that's how you write a sham, but like it gets that's a that's what happens in Warsh. Like Yu'minu becomes Yuminu. So that's that's Arabic. So this part of Arabic when you have uh Hamza uh, with the sukun, it gets converted into a long that's what the original word is sham becomes known as sham, but you can read it both ways. So, <laughs> كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم مادة 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 فيها أبا سفيان وكفار قريش. Okay, let's stop here. So Abu Sufyan, so Abdullah ibn Abbas is the rawi. He's saying Abu Sufyan ibn Harb uh, informed him that Heraclius, Heracl, that's how you say it in Arabic, أرسلهي في ركب من قريش. He sent for him while he was in a rock. Rakab of the Quraysh. Uh, Rakab is a small caravan, like it's uh, roughly close to 10. So Rakab in Arabic is when you have a group, um, and the group is composed of a small number of people. So it's, uh, so it's be, some, some scholars say it's between 10 to 20. So Rakab is a caravan of 10 plus camel riders, um, or 20 to 30 or something like that. So it's a, it's a fairly large group. So uh, Abu Sufyan was among this caravan and Heraclius sent for him. And Wakanu, what were they doing? To Jaron Bisham, Filmudda, and they were trading in Sham. What were they doing in Syria? 
Sham is Syria, the Levant. This is that area that you see on the map. Um, oh, online students, one moment. Okay, so Sham refers to that Levant area, the Mediterranean region of just present day Palestine and um, you know Lebanon and Syria and even parts of Iraq. So that whole area is Sham. So Abu Sufyan was trading there. They were Tujar, and Heraclius sent for them. Continue. Oh, uh, hang on. Fil Mudda in the period that Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was in a truce with Abu Sufyan and the Kuffar of Quraysh. So what was that truce? Sira. Hudaybiyah, yeah. So Hudaybiyah was a 10-year truce. It started in the year 6 of the Hijri calendar. Um, so that's, there was a prolonged period where they were in a truce. So this is one of the things, like, you know, when the treaty was signed, if you go back to the Sira, how upset the Muslims were because the terms were so unfair or seems to be so unfair to the Muslims. But the Prophet ﷺ, he knew there was a higher wisdom and he told them to be patient. So they were patient and um, these are the fruits of that. Because of that patience, look at all these things that are happening. You know, people have a chance to breathe, to interact. And so many more people embraced Islam in that period than any other period. So um, so this was a, a trade mission. So Abu Sufyan, he says uh, in another report that, you know, when we were fighting, we were all preoccupied until this truce happened and we needed it as badly as the Muslims did because we needed to trade, we needed to make money. So they took a badly needed trade mission to Syria. And he says that I was carrying wares on behalf of every man and woman in Mecca. So like, you know, you would send your goods to be sold in these caravans. Um, so Abu Sufyan is traveling on a trade mission and Heraclius sent for him and then continue. Okay, is Wahoma or Hua? Home. Okay, so my the Dar Islam version has Wahua. So, what does everyone else have? Wahom. Okay. So, Fatahu, and they came to him, and he was in Ilya. So, what is Ilya? Anyone know what Ilya? Jerusalem. Yeah, it's the name of Jerusalem. So, uh, Al Quds. So that's the ancient Roman name. So what does that come from? It comes from, you know, um, I mean, there's different reasons given for that name, but basically it's a, it's a Roman person uh, by the name of Alias or Alia. Um, and he basically, when he uh, took over, the, the Romans took over the city in the year 70. Um, yeah, go ahead. Is this the same word as Homer? No, because as so it could be related, but it's not coming from there, but it could be related. Because so this one, the story goes that the Romans crushed the Jewish rebellion in the year 70, and Titus took the city by force, killed 133,000 people. And then the Roman Emperor Hadrian later built a Roman colony named Aelia Capitolina. Because um, his Hadrian, this the Roman Emperor, um, one of his names was Aelius, A-E-L-I-U-S. So he built this colony here and it became known as Ilia, and that's the Arabized name of that. And that was the name until the Muslims conquered hundreds of years later. So it it's basically goes back to a Roman occupation and is named after an emperor. And that's what Ilia is. So Hadrian, uh, that was his other name. He also, he's the same emperor that built Hadrianopolis that became Adrianopolis. And then when the Ottomans took over, they called it Adirne. That's the city of Adirne on the western coast, uh, the western border of, <clears throat> of of Turkey today. So it used to be the capital of the Roman province of, of, of Thrace. So this is a this Hadrianopolis named after the Roman Emperor Hadrian. It's the site of no less than 16 major battles. And the British historian, one of them, he called it the most contested spot on the globe. It's a very interesting place when you go there today. It's a you can tell it looks like uh, it has Greek influences and it has the most beautiful masjid in Turkey is there. The, the number one, uh, the prize of the architect uh, Sinan Pasha is uh, in Dirne, which is right on the border of Greece. 
So you can even walk and see the border of Greece. It says Yunanistan. There's a sign that, like one of those highway signs here, Skyway, New Brunswick, or there it'll say Yunanistan going forward. That's the, uh, the name for Greece. So anyway, so Elia is a, the, the city of Jerusalem. There's a lot of history here. So to know the history, maybe we can do a brief diversion. So I have a couple of things I wanted to share. Um, so Heraclius, who was Heraclius and what was going on in this time? Um, <clears throat> so Heraclius reigned from 610 to 641. This is the Christian calendar. Now, for him, the dates, these dates work better because that's their history, right? So 610 to 641 was the reign of the Emperor Heraclius, the Emperor of the Byzantine Empire. Um, in contrast, to compare that to the prophetic dates, um, these are the prophetic dates, just so you have an, a sense of a timeline. 610 is the year Revelation began. So 610, that's the same year Heraclius came to the throne. Uh, 622 is the Hijra. Um, and that's year one of the Hijri calendar. And then 632 was the demise of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So Heraclius was the emperor throughout the reign of Nubuwa, the Byzantine emperor, 610 to 641. So the Byzantine empire reigned from 306 to 1453. So the Byzantine empire, I mean, it's, we don't have time for history, but the ancient Roman empire was like, um, well, let me throw all the dates out. There was a Roman Republic in 509 BC. That was a city state. That's when Carthage and Greece and all these, Homer's Iliad, that's from that time period. So it was basically a city state and ended with Julius Caesar. Then it got converted into a more global empire. Then the, there was a fall of the Eastern Roman Empire. And then the Byzantines was the resurrection of the Roman Empire in the West. So the Byzantine Empire was from 306 all the way to 1453 when Muhammad Fatih um, conquered uh, Constantinople and made it the city of Istanbul. So this is a rough timeline. Um, just so other dates that are important, Constantine was the founder of the Byzantine Empire. He's, he reigned from 306 to 337. Um, Council of Nicaea is important in Christianity, was in 325. Just so you have a sense, that's 300 years before this period. <clears throat> and then there were the Byzantine Sassanid Wars, that's the Romans and the Persians fighting for hundreds of years. Um, but the current version of that, the Byzantine and the Sassanids, was 602 to 628. So that was going on in the backdrop of the Sira. <clears throat> so a lot of the, you know, the Surat al-Rum, Ghulibat al-Rum, fi adna al-Arb, wa hum min ba'di ghalabihim sayaghlibun, fi bidu arsinin. Allah speaks about the battles between the Romans and the Persians, and Allah predicts that they have won. Uh, one side has won today, but they will be victorious again shortly. And then the Persian sacking of Jerusalem was in 614. And the Sassanid Empire, which is a rival empire, reigned from 224 to 651. So they were crushed by the Muslims. They collapsed in 651, very short, shortly after the, 20 years after the Prophet passed, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Persian Empire collapsed, the Sassanid Empire. And then the Byzantium continued for some time until 1453. So just so you have a quick timeline. So Heraclius was the emperor of the Byzantine Empire. Um, now, there's some titles that are used in this hadith and others. So the Roman title for leadership is what? Like, what do you call? Caesar, yeah, from Julius Caesar. Because Julius Caesar is the one who converted the Roman city-state to a global empire. So. You know, that's usually what happens from the name of like a great ruler, then that becomes a title. So Caesar, the Arabic, Arabicized version of Caesar is what? Qaisar. So Qaisar. Um, other names that are used in the Roman for Roman leaders, Augustus, Dominus, Imperator. So all these are names that come from like uh, different people and they're used for the leadership or for the emperors. And Caesar um was the english or anglicized version of that and also uh kaiser is also used from that and also czar of the 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 russians you know that comes from the same terms um for the greeks the name for the ruler would be basilius and for the persians what was the name of ruler husra husra in persian but then it became Kisra in arabic and latinized as cyrus 
So now you see the name Cyrus, it goes back to that. Kisra in Arabic goes back to that, and Khusra in Persian. The name for a ruler in the Turkish tradition is what? No, Sultan is much later. That's Arabic, though. They took it from Arabic. But from um, Turkish, that's also much later. Shah is Persian. Shah just means king. It's Khaqan, or Khan, or Han. That's why, you know, it goes back to Genghis Khan, the Mongols. It's a Mongol tradition, right? Genghis Khan. So that's where the Muslims have the last name Khan. It goes back to that. And in Turkish, it's pronounced Han, right? Um, in Abyssinia, what's the ruler's name? Najashi, Najash, the Negus. So these are all like titles that are used for the ruler. For the Coptics in Egypt, Firaun. So Firaun, yeah, that's the name, like the pharaohs. Related to, related to who? Bloodline, Whose bloodline? The bloodline? Oh, yeah, yeah, because because the believers left Egypt, right? And then the leadership drowned in the Red Sea, Firaun. So they were the remnants that were left were the, the Coptics, yeah. Um, Wait, so they were around when they come to Yeah, yeah. But they didn't call themselves that, but yeah. And the, there were three main ethnic groups in Egypt. There were the believers, there were Bani Israel. They were like migrants, but they had settled there. Then there was the ruling class of the pharaohs. There was a specific dynasty and people. And then there were the, the masses, the common people. They were mostly slaves. They were the Coptics. And then finally, West Africa and the Mali Empire was the name of the rulers. Mansa. That's why you have Mansa Musa. Mansa is the ruler. So it's important to know these things because, like, you're going to read hadith, you're going to. Kaisara wa Kisra is used a lot in literature. And also, Najashi is used in hadith literature. Uh, Fir'aun, for sure, is in the Quran as well. So, all these things are very, very important. So, okay. Any questions? Mm hmm. Exactly, yeah. Council of Nicaea is what converted the Roman Empire from a pagan one to a newfound Christian one. But it was a kind of like a Trinitarian Christian. So they adopted Trinitarian Christianity. Council of Nicaea took place in a place in Turkey. You can go there today. It's a masjid today. But the place, uh, what's the name of the city? Nicaea, I think. Ni Nicaea, yeah, Nicaea. Okay. Let's continue reading. Okay, so let's continue to read, but I'll, I'll translate quickly. Um, so they, he said, um, he called us to his majlis. And around him, Hawlahu or the Ma'urum, were the notables of the his leaders, his ministers. Thumma da'ahum wa da'a tarjumani or tarjumanahu. Here I have a different version. So he called them forward and he called the translator. So there was translator because not everyone spoke the same language. They always had translators. Continue. <laughs> He said, so which one of you is closest in lineage to this man who claims to be a prophet? Continue. So Abu Sufyan replied, I am the one who is closest in lineage because they have a common ancestor in Abd Manaf, like two or three generations above the Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Um, it's exactly, I'll tell you. Abu Sufyan's father was Jatab, whose father was Umayyah, whose father was Abu Shams, and then whose father was Abdul, Abd Manaf. And Abd Manaf had another line, Hashim, Abdul Muttalib, Abdullah, and Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa So his three generations uh, removed. So he was a distant cousin. Continue. So he said, okay, come close to me. And he brought um, him close, Abu Sufyan, closer to him. 
And he said, put his companions behind him and let my translator come here. So what was he doing? His strategy is very smart. Um, he wanted his companions to be behind him so like he wouldn't, they wouldn't talk to each other and he wanted to ask him some honest questions. So continue. <laughs> Okay. So he said to the translator, look, oh, no, he said to the companions of, of Abu Sufyan, I'm going to ask him a series of questions and about this man. And if he lies about it, just make a signal that he's lying so that he won't know. Um, just give me a signal. And Abu Sufyan said, Wallahi, if it wasn't for the fact that I would, you know, I was afraid of being deemed a liar, my companions labeled me a liar, I would probably have lied upon the Prophet. So that was a smart strategy, right? So like, uh, you know, because now, now you create this conflict of interest. Now Abu Sufyan, if he says something wrong, one of his companions might disagree with him. If he says, if he lies, and then he'll be called out. So that fear made him um, tell the truth. Continue. ثم كان أول ما سألني عنه أن قال كيف نسبه فيكم. So the first question he asks is, what is his uh, genealogy among you people? What's his line lineage? Continue. قلت هو فينا ذو نسب. So the the answer was he's he has a good lineage. He's known to come from a good family. قال فهل قال فهل قال هذا القول منكم أحد قط قبله قط لا. He said, has anyone else claimed this before him? And he said, no. Because he's looking for like, you know, signs of like, because they had a sense that there was a prophet coming and he was also learned and he was a believer in his own faith. So he said, anybody else claim something before him? He said, no. Malikin. Mm -hmm. Is there anybody in his ancestors who was a leader or a king? And he said, no. He said, oh, are the strong people following him or the weak people? And the answer is the weak people. He said, are his followers increasing or decreasing? His followers were increasing. So he says, when people embrace his faith, do a lot of people leave after that? And he said, no. He says, do you, have you ever called him a liar before he made these claims? Like, was he known to be dishonest? He said, no. Does he ever betray people? He said no. So the uh, next question was, so the, the question was, does he ever betray people? He said no, but we're currently in a treaty, so I don't know what he's going to do. And he said, this is the most I could say about him. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Continue. Have you fought him? Yes. He said, have you been fighting him? He said, yes. How is that fight between you? He said, it's like war, one day for them, one day for us. It's back and forth. Okay. So then he said, okay, what is he calling you to? What does he command? And he gave a beautiful summary. He says, 
commands us to worship none but Allah and not to associate any partners with him. And leave what your forefathers have said, commands us with prayer and honesty and chastity and, and relations, uh, keeping the relations of family. And then he said to his translator, okay, now give him this answer from me. So now he gives an answer. Saltuka. Saltuka nasabihi. So he said, first I asked you about his lineage, and that's because prophets are sent um, in, in good families um, to their own people. Continue. Yeah. From their own people, yeah. From their own people, right. From their own people, right. Good families of their own people, like they're sent to their own kind. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So he said, okay, and I asked you, has anyone said something like this before? And you said no. If you had said yes, I would have thought that he was following a previous statement of one of his ancestors or someone else. Continue. So I asked you if there's any kings in his family. You said no. Had he said yes, then there could have been a conflict of interest. He might have been seeking leadership again, restored the glory of the family. So he said, I asked you, you know, if he, if he ever accused of telling lies and he said no. Uh, so the translation is, so I wondered how a person who does not tell a lie about others could ever tell a lie about Allah. Yeah. So I asked you, is weak people or strong people following you? You said weak people and those are generally the followers of prophets. So he said, ask him as followers increasing and decreasing. You're saying increasing and that's the sign of true faith. Iman, it just increases among people. Okay. Then he said, I asked if anybody uh, leaves that religion after dis embracing it, becoming displeased with it. You said no. And that's a sign of true faith when the delight enters the heart, mixes with them completely. So the kartu an la. Yeah, wasaltu. So I asked you, if, does he betray anyone? And you said no. And prophets never betray anyone or commit treachery. Mm -hmm. 
لقاءهم ولا كنت ولا كنت عنده لا غسلت لا غسلت عن قدم قدميه قدميه so that's dual right قدمين two feet قدميه his two feet we drop the noon at the end so he said Khadamihi. Okay, so you can say it that way too. So the answer is, uh, well, I asked you what he teaches and um, this is the answer he gave. And if what you said is true, this man will one day occupy this place I am standing in. And I would love to meet him. And I would, uh, I thought he was coming from among our people, but now I realize he's coming from outside of our people. And if I find out where he is, I would go immediately to meet him. And if I were with him, I would certainly wash his feet. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Continue. Thumma da'a. Thumma da'a bi kitabi Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Alladhi ba'atha fihi dihyatu ila azimi busra. Fadafa'ahu ila hiraqal. Faqara'ahu fa ila fihi bismillah. Okay. Okay. Then he asked for the letter that the messenger had written, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, delivered by Dihya to the governor of Busa. And he brought the letter forward and he read it. You had a question? Literally, yeah, because that's a Roman tradition. That's what they did with the prophets, with the great people, they would wash their feet. Even today, where do you see that? There's a remnant of that. No, like remnant of, of their tradition, the Pope. Have you not seen the Pope washing people's feet. I've seen it like the modern Pope. They do it with certain people like but that's a as a tradition that comes from is one of the good traditions that they have is just it's a Roman tradition. Yeah. Okay, so the problem is trying to go fast. I'm reading the Darussalam version. So I'm not reading the, the manuscript. So um, so this is not that reliable. So like, it's probably, you guys are more correct. So you said, Bartha Fihi? That's a Fihi, the B, okay. So then the letter. So this is the letter of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wasallam. Okay, read it. Okay. Okay, so the letter is one of the letters of the Prophet to Heraclius. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful, from Muhammad Abdil, ibn Abdullah. Uh, no, Muhammad, the slave of Allah and his messenger to Heracl, the great ruler of Rome. Peace be upon those who follow guidance. I call you with the call of Islam. I embrace Islam and you will be protected. Allah will bring you double reward. But if you turn away, then you will bear the sin of all the people that follow you. So, and then he recited the verse. Well, he wrote the verse. Ya Ahl al Kitabi, O people of the book. Come to a word that is common between you and us. That we worship none but Allah. We associate no partners with him. And the end of the verse. So this is a simple short letter that was written by the Prophet Sallallahu to Heraclius. And Harisiyin, just a quick note. What does that mean? It's a strange word. Um, but it's generally translated as followers or peasants or your common folk. But, um, you know, um, also is... Um, it might go back to Arius. There was a priest named Arius. No, it might go back to Arian, the Arian nation. Um, so there's like a dispute over the origins of that word. But the, from the meaning of the sense of the letter, it means you will bear the sin of those who are following you, who are under your command, your subject tree, 
your citizenry, whatever you want to call that. So Arisiin. So this is a simple letter of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You know, so the letters that are out there, the Prophet, they're not really authentic. So um, Shaykh Akram told me yesterday uh, when we were talking about the Maghazi of Musa bin Uqba, he said like the most authentic versions of all the letters of the Prophet are all in Sahih Bukhari and Muslim. Everything outside of it that exists, even if it's in like parchment or manuscripts, they're not authentic. Um, so because that was the job of, of people like Imam Malik and Imam al-Bukhari, they authenticated everything and they preserved the most um, authentic forms of uh, of the things, of the reports that existed, of the letters, of the teachings, of the sunnah. So not everything that is produced as a letter of the Prophet, so some of all the sources are authentic. But if you want the most authentic version, this is where you go. The most authentic sirah, this is where you go. The authentic, most authentic tafsir, this is where you go. Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim. Outside of that, you have to take it with a grain of salt. Don't reject everything, but take it with a grain of salt. Um, okay, continue. قال أبو سفيان فلما قال ما قال وفرغ من قراءة الكتاب كثر عنده الصخب وارتفعت الأصوات وأخرجنا. Okay, so let's, so when he finished reading the letter, um, he said صخب. A shouting. Shouting started happening everywhere. Um, and voices began to be raised and they quickly kicked us out of that majlis. So you can imagine, look at where the conversation is headed. This is Heraclius, the emperor of Rome, the Byzantine Empire, the Western Roman Empire. So when they got to this point, you can imagine that not everyone's going to be on the same wavelength. And this is, this is a crisis, of the highest magnitude. So um, people started shouting, um, people began getting, getting nervous, and they said they just kicked us out. Continue. Okay. Okay, hang on. So he said, Ibn Abu Sufyan said to his companions that when he was leaving, he said, look, um, the matter of Ibn Abi Kabshah um, is such, is becoming so prominent that even the king of Banil Asfar, the Byzantines, Banil Asfar, is afraid of him. Um, so Ibn Abi Kabsha, that's his way of referring to the Prophet Sallallahu So Ibn Abi Kabsha is like, they, although that's not in the lineage of the Prophet Sallallahu but it was like a derogatory thing. I don't know where the source of that is, but he was referring to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi And uh, and then he said, look, the, even the kings of Banil Asfar are afraid of him. And then he said, there I began to be sure that he would be the conqueror in the near future until I embrace Islam. So that means... There was a transformation beginning to happen in Abu Sufyan. There was a gradual transformation. It wasn't an immediate thing. And that's generally what happens with Islam. Like some people's immediate. You embrace Islam and it's all uphill after that. But many people, they take their time. Um, the Iman enters the heart in stages. So it's not that strong. So in, in the Sira, there's many examples of that where companions are coming closer to Islam. Their minds are opening up, but not yet. But then they're still taking their time and then something else happens and something else happens until that's it, then they're ready. So Abu Sufyan, he says, this is the stirrings of faith started happening for me. And in, it was much later, even in conquest of Mecca, he overtly embraced Islam, but he hadn't entered fully. So even when he embraced Islam, it wasn't full there until it became um, much later. Okay, continue. صاحب إياه وهرقل سقفا على نصار على نصار الشام يحدث أن هرقل حين قدم إياه أصحاب يوما قبيس الناس فقال بعض بطالقته وقد استنكرنا هيئة هيئة قال ابن ناظور وقال هرقل 
Hazzaan yanzuru fil nujum. Okay, so then the sub-narrator, there's now the story kind of shifts. So Ibn Natur was a governor of Ilya. So we have Ibn Natur, but it's also right Ibn Nadur. There are different ways of reading it. Uh, the Arabic name of this person was Haris al-Bustan. He was a governor of this province, Ilya. So he relates, uh, you know, in an incident that, look, prior to this, what happened is one day Heracles was visiting Jerusalem. He got up in a sad mood and... And they asked him, you know, why are you in that mood? And Heraclius was a foreteller, a fortune teller, like Hadza. And he used to yandru fin nujum. He used to look into the stars. And, and from the stars, like this is astrology. He, would, um, he had some awareness of what, the things that were happening in the world and were going to happen. I mean, of course, that's not a, it's a science we're prohibited from. But sometimes, you know, through these occult elements with the jinn, there are realities to that still makes it totally haram you know muslims are not allowed to engage in any of that so continue so he said last night i saw when i was looking at the stars that the leader or the king of those who are circumcised um is going to appear so he then I asked, who are the people who are practice circumcision in among various peoples? So the people, his minister said to him, look, only the Jews practice circumcision. You don't have to worry about them. All you have to do is write a letter um, to, you know, your ministers to kill every Jew present in the country. Just kill them all off. That's the solution. Continue. He said, while we were discussing this, this conversation was happening, a messenger came um, from the king of Ghassan, that's a tribe in the north of Arabia, and he came to Heraclius and brought to him the news of the messenger of Allah. Hmm. Okay, hold on. So then he said, you know, I asked my messengers, go find out if he is circumcised. And the Arabs, the people that he's born in, are they circumcised? And the answer was yes, their practice is to be circumcised. And then he says, Hada mulku, hadihil umma qad dahar, or you might have Malik. This is the kingdom, or this is the king that is going to appear. Continue. <laughs> So he wrote a letter to one of his companions who was as learned as he. So one of his scholarly companions wrote a letter to him. Continue. Okay, so and then Heraclius uh, wrote, uh, then left for Hims. Hims is a town in Syria, Homs. Uh, so, where do we see that word today? We've mentioned that word today. Who's from Hims? Abul Yaman. So, Abul Yaman, the teacher of Bukhari, is from Hims, who's relating this hadith. So, do you think that's a coincidence? Probably not, knowing who Bukhari was. 
That's probably why he brought the Hadith of Abu Yaman. Because the Hadith is about Heraclius in Jerusalem and Hims. And then Abu Yaman is someone from that region. So, Allah alam is a question you have to think. Continue. فلم يلم حمص حتى أتاه كتاب من صاحب يوافق رأي إراقي على خروج النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم وأنه نبي. So he said his letter, his answer from his scholarly companion agreed with him that this was the prophet that is going to appear. فأذن إراقي لعظماء الروم في في دسرة له في حمص ثم أمر بأبوابها فغلق. Okay, so then he gathered all the heads of the Byzantines assembled in the palace at Homs. Uh, Daskara is a palace surrounded by houses. So that's what that means. And he ordered the doors to be closed and locked. Then he said, Ya Marshal of Rome, O Byzantines, O people of Rome. Al continue. Allah kumfi falfala. You have Hadan Nabi? Okay. So he said to them, O oh people of Rome, if success is your desire and guidance is what you want, um, and you want your empire to remain, not be destroyed, then you buy your. Uh, pledge your allegiance to this prophet. Continue. He said, and then everyone ran for the doors, but the doors were locked. So that was the reaction of the people. They ran. Continue. They ran like wild donkeys. Those are wild uh, animals or wild donkeys. Continue. <laughs> when Heraclius saw this reaction of theirs and how they hated what he said, he called for them to come back. Hey, wait a minute, come back. He said, I was just testing you. I was trying to see who's firm on your religion. <laughs> Keep going. So they became so happy they prostrated to him. That's a Roman tradition too, prostrating down to another person. And that was the end of the matter of Heraclius. So at the end, he says, Rawahu Saleh ibn Kaysan wa Yunus wa Ma'mar an Zuhri. Remember the six students of Zuhri? And I added Saleh ibn Kaysan, that could be number seven. So this is a supporting chain. So this same story comes through these other students of Zuhri as well. So it's a great story. Um, when the, and this, this concludes the chapter of Kitab al Wahi. So to conclude, you know, when Imam Bukhari brings supporting chains, is usually for a reason. There's a reason for everything in this book. So there must be a reason. When you see something like that, you have to ask yourself, okay, what's going on here? So the reason likely is that Abu Yaman is not the strongest teacher of Imam al-Bukhari. So, um, so when that's the case, when his teacher is not the strongest, or there's some possible deficiency in this snad, then you bring supporting chains to bolster that snad. So that's what's happening here. If this was Imam Malik, he would never do that. Um, or Malik in the chain and a strong teacher of his going through Imam Malik, he would never do that. So, so you have, so this Isnad, so next to Abu Yaman, you can add these three other names and they're all going to Zuhri. Um, so this is like a supporting chain. Yes, yeah, above him. So it's Mutaba'a Qasira, remember Tamma and Qasira? So, Sometimes you, did a, you do a supporting chain. You don't quote your teachers, but you go above. So there's, so he'll, he skipped his teachers. He said, well, above him, above me, there are other reports that go through these other students of Zuhri. So it's given like a partial chain. So that's Qasira, Mutaba Qasira, not Tama. A complete Mutaba would be my teacher from there 
joining to this chain at some level. So he doesn't quote the entire chain. We saw that in another hadith. Yes, sir. Where's the mic? You can keep talking. He basically left Islam and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered them to get uh, the Prophet to marry her. And uh, um, the Majasya was the one you know, who did the, let's say, the marriage. So you're Prophet. talking about just repeat Umm Ramla, like who's in? So, Umm Ramla, I mean, Umm Habiba, or Umm Habib. Abu Sufyan, she's obviously their daughter. and. He's the very person who says nobody has you know, left Islam, but obviously we know that his son-in-law itself left Islam. Uh, this was obviously in, in, in obviously, obviously mm -hmm. in the world. So at this point in time, how do you understand these narratives? Did we say that at this point in time it didn't happen? Or was he, did he just mean in terms of numbers? Or it was just that one case? Or, because there are other narrations also that then, they have these one-offs here and there, but not. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm trying to understand. Yeah, that's a good question. So the, like, like, does anybody leave the faith after they enter it? That's a general question. He said no, but there were some cases like, I think his name was... Ubaidullah. There you go. <laughs> we have a running joke. So Ubaidullah, all the Ubaidullahs we find in history are bad. Um, so I've always wondered why my father named me Ubaidullah. The first one I discovered, Ubaidullah bin Mahdi, founder of the Fatimid Empire. And I learned of Ubaidullah, the one who killed Imam Hussein to tomorrow, by you know, the 10th of Ashura. And then there's so many others. And then there's an Ubaidullah who was Muslim, but when he I migrated to Abyssinia, he became Christian and left Islam. So that was the son-in-law of Abu Sufyan. And then Azim, the reason is uh, Azim, this poor guy, named his son Ubaidullah in 2021. What? How old was, when, when was he born? Okay, <laughs> 11 years ago. <laughs> so need to ask him what was what's going on there. So yeah, so this happened obviously in Abyssinia. This is before this incident. Hudaybiyah happened much later. So what's going on there? Probably he didn't know about it because like all this matters, they, they come out years later, right? Like, so a lot of the people hadn't come back from Abyssinia yet or maybe they came back. So possibly he didn't know about it. But more likely, I think, it was probably a general question. Generally, do people leave? So if you look at, you know, 124,000 companions, how many instances we have people who left? Maybe four or five out of 124,000. That's like negligible. So generally, the principle stands that you know, people don't leave Islam. Um, at that time, they weren't leaving Islam once they embrace it. Allahu alam. Yes. Mm -hmm. Which one? oh yeah so it's added so so this is a composite reconstruction story that's what hadith represents it's not just a single statement that's memorized and recorded from beginning to end so this part is added by some narrator so these great people like zuhri shuaib and others they're like verifying that they feel it's authentic so they include it as part of the whole story but you're right it's not abu sufyan that was there but it was added to the story later. And Abu Sufyan is not narrating the hadith, it's Ibn Abbas. So likely it was Ibn Abbas or someone under him that added this portion from another source. But because Ibn Abbas is reliable, they're able to reconstruct events like that. So that happens, all, the, the suicide hadith, right? Suppose the suicide hadith, the same thing. So people add things to hadith, like sometimes they fit very well, sometimes it could be inauthentic. The donkey description is that making that No, we don't know because it's a reconstruction, right? So it's very ironic. Why? Because in the Old Testament, in Genesis. Okay. The Any that's bring made, it close? The attack that's made on the Prophet is that he's from the lineage of Ismail. And Ismail is described as a wild donkey. No. In the book of Genesis. And that's the attack that they made against the Arabs that all you guys are wild donkeys. Oh wow. So, so, um, so that could so then then ironic. then then it means that the source of this code the description is from the Roman side, either Heraclius himself or someone who's narrating the story that's telling the story from the Roman sources. 
probably Ibn Natur, possibly the governor. He's the one who's, you know, narrating this portion of the story. Who did he tell to? Allah So, would this movie be categorized as, as Christian or just pagan? Rock no, they were Christian. Christian. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah. They're Christian at this point. They're they're believer. They were looking for a prophet from their scriptures. For sure, they were Christian. Anyone else? Yes. So, this hadith, when I first read it uh, a couple of years back, uh, I, I was a little confused by the fact that he seemed very accepting with his first uh, question. Like he knew the truth, he knew uh, what he was asking, and all the answers that were given to him were the right answers. And he, he basically, in the end, had everything that he was the prophet, and that's why he even made the statement that I would go and wash his feet. But then, toward the end, it seemed as if he completely rejected it. Um, like, it what I was more confused about the fact that it seemed like he was for it. And all of a sudden, the hadith goes towards the end where it says that if you want to go towards success, then follow this uh, person. Yeah, so that's an excellent question. So, I mean, to get into psychology, what happened, obviously, we could tell that he wanted to accept, but there are many factors that prevent people from accepting the truth. And how many people you know today that know Islam is the truth? All of us, like who are involved in Dawah, they know. There are many people who say, "Yeah, you're right. Everything makes sense. It is the truth." But I'm just not ready. I just don't want to do. It. I just don't want to go against my family, or I just don't want to. I just there's different reasons. So Heraclius, there's power at play, right? Power and prestige, and sometimes that's a preventative force. In the end, he was unlucky. He didn't accept, but. Uh, you know, it was a saving, like he saved himself by saying, oh, I was just testing you because I guess he chose to be the leader of the people, chose the power over the truth, you know, but like, who knows? Nobody, it's just something so, we have to guess at. Would you say psychologically he said the test was for himself to see if the people would accept it and he would accept it? Probably, I think it was probably more spontaneous than that. Possibly, like he probably was all you know like enthusiastic and when he saw the reaction something in him changed and he recalibrated who knows on the spot you know like these things human human beings are complicated right you know we all make decisions on the fly but in the end so this story ends like the chapter kitab al-wahi and i have some things to cover so we need to move forward um so let's take a quick break um not a physical break but like a mental break and stretching break um, yeah, you can go grab dessert. Yeah, that's a good idea. So go grab a piece of cake and come back and we'll conclude. We have conclusions to do on Imam al-Bukhari. So we have to talk about Imam al-Bukhari's trial and how he passed. And then just some concluding remarks about the Sahih. So 1030 we're supposed to end, but it is what it is. <laughs> uh -huh. What happened? Oh, no, it's still the same. Uh, it's still the same, yeah. But I found a way to remedy it. But um, but uh, okay, well, we can do it at the end because I'm still in class. It wasn't a physical break. I just want to. Um, I don't call it. I just want to see your RAM allocation by the time. Uh, okay. Inshallah. Inshallah. That's probably what it is. I have so many windows open. Okay. This is not a physical break, guys. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Yeah. Go get a thing while I keep talking. Get your dessert while I'm talking and come back. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Bukhari's trial. Bukhari's trial. So, the last piece of the story of Imam al-Bukhari, his personal story, now we're switching gears. It's a very interesting story, very sad and tragic at the same time. Um, we spent the entire month looking at his life, his remarkable life, and um, now every life comes to an end. So, what were some of the things that happened, um, you know, towards the end of his life? So, before that first, you know, you have to understand some locations. So this is a map of 
where all of this is taking place. Okay. Okay, where's my cursor? Oh, there you go. Okay. So Bukhari is from uh, Bukhara, right? So you have that on the extreme west. So if you look at the map, you can see that, you know, cities like Baghdad and Damascus and Jerusalem, this hadith is based in Jerusalem. But then you have like, you know, uh, Isfahan in the middle, you have uh, Nishapur more towards the west, then you have Marv, you have Bukhara, Samarkand, Balkh, and Hirak. So these are the great centers of the Muslim world at that time. This is where the Muhaddithin came from. You know, all of them came from the west. I mean, not the west, sorry, the east. I'm looking at the wrong side. The east, um, east of the Muslim world. So Bukhari means he was from Bukhara. Someone who comes from Marv, uh, what do you call them? Al Marwazi. There's so many Muhaddithin with the laqab Marwazi. Someone who comes from Nishapur, Nishapuri or Nisapur. Someone comes from Herat. That's in present day Afghanistan. So what do you call them? So this 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 manuscript of the Sahih, this particular manuscript that I have of the Sahih, is compiled by a student of the student of Bukhari who's from Afghanistan, from Herat. What was his name? Abu Dhar. Al Harawi. So if you're from Herat, you get the laqab Al Harawi. Uh, one of the teachers of Bukhari, Qutayba ibn Sa'id al Balkhi. That's Balkh. So all these are real cities. When you have these names, you have to tie them. Like, you know, I'm trying to bring the, the names of the narrators alive to you. And I'm trying to, you know, also the places need to come alive for you. So these are the places that these scholars traveled. And so just to show a map, and now because what happened towards the end of Bukhari's life, um, he was searching for a place to settle and eventually he could not find any place. So he went from one of these cities to the next. So this whole region is so fascinating, such a beautiful region. Some of the most stunning images of Muslim uh, locations and Muslim masajid come from this region. So I compiled a couple of pictures that, are, that show you the beauty of this region. This is a masjid um, somewhere in this region. I think that's from Bukhara. So this, these are the places where these great muhaddithin lived. They thrived, they traveled, they did what they needed to do. Um, this is the setting, okay? Um, these are the colors of this region, right? Um, this is what it looks like. Um, you know, this is the land, like it's an arid desert landscape. Um, it's beautiful, it's stunning. Um, it's uh, filled with like mountains and horses and incredible architecture. This picture is uh, the mausoleum where Imam al-Bukhari was buried. Well, it was a graveyard and later became a mausoleum. This is the resting place of the great Imam al-Bukhari, rahimahullah ta'ala. So I just wanted to share you the images. So just so you have a sense of Central Asia, it's a beautiful, stunning place. And it's worth going there. I mean, I've never been there, but it's also always a dream of mine to visit the great places where these tr scholars traveled. So that brings us to the demise or, or the trials of Imam al-Bukhari first. So what happened towards the end of his life, he was involved in a little bit of controversy. And it's controversy that he kind of, uh, you know, led, you know, it, it lasted until the end of his life, unfortunately. So... He was coming back from a region looking for a place to stay. This is after he, towards the end of his life, he died in the year 256. So then to, the year 250, he visited Nishapur, the great city of Nishapur, center of, of that region, a capital. So when he arrived, so, you know, remember, recall everything I told you about his life, how famous he was when he was 16. He was like, you know, making jaws drop at the age of 16. And as he got older, he wrote his first book and his second book. Then he compiled the Jami of Sahih. So over 16 years, then he started teaching it. He became more and more famous. Everywhere he went, there were you know, thousands of people um, studying from him, looking for him. So when he came to Nishapur, um, there were so many people that, that came out to see him. They say there were um, you know, uh, 400 writers or that came out to visit him. They said people were camped out when they knew that he was coming. They camped out in the outskirts of the city, sleeping there for days just to catch a glimpse of him. 
And when he came, um, he came to the main masjid, began teaching. Um, tens of thousands of people were learning from him. So in Nishapur, the main scholar was Muhammad ibn Yahya Dhuhali, and that's the person he was involved in a controversy with. And he was one of his associates and teachers as well, Muhammad ibn Yahya Dhuhli, or Dhuhali. Um, I shared with you like that scene, one of the students said, I saw Bukhari standing with Muhammad bin Yahya at a janaza, and Muhammad bin Yahya is asking him questions. Okay, so that's a that's an insult that tells you it's a little bit about Ra'aytul Bukhari fi janazatin wa Muhammad ibn Yahya Dhuhli yas'aluhu anil asma'i wal ilal wal Bukhari yamurru fihi mithla saham ka'annahu yaqra' quluhu wallahu ahad He said, I saw this scene where Dhuhli is asking Bukhari all sorts of questions and Bukhari is answering back fine questions, deep questions about ilal and hadith defects Bukhari, his answer is like arrows flying from a bow. And he said, it's like he was reciting, Qul Allahu Ahad. So this was a great associate of Imam al-Bukhari, a teacher, and they were fellow, like they learned from each other. But when he came to Nishapur, and there were so many people that came out to meet him, um, you know, things began to happen. So probably the analysis, long story short, probably there was some jealousy involved. And the circles of this great teacher began to become smaller. People started going to Bukhari. So his classes became larger. The classes of Imam al uh became uh, lower. Imam Muslim used to live in Nishapur. Now he was from Nishapur. Muslim ibn Hajjaj and Naysapuri. So Muslim was his great student in Nishapur and he hosted Imam al-Bukhari. So Muslim says that his reception in Nishapur was unprecedented. Even rulers didn't have that kind of reception. So what happened is somebody asked him some questions and, you know, shaitan comes in. There was a misunderstanding that arose about a specific issue and a question that Bukhari was asked. And that question had to do with this controversy that was raging in that time or prior to that time about the createdness of the Quran, khalq al-Quran. Remember, that was the same controversy that Imam Ahmad took that stand in and so the idea is, or the, the issue is, is the Qur'an makhluq, a creation of Allah, or is it part of Allah's essence, right? So that was a deep philosophical debate. So many of the early scholars, like Jahan ibn Safwan and others, their view was that the Qur'an could not be part of Allah, because if the Qur'an exists and is part of Allah's essence, and Allah exists, Qur'an coexists with Allah, that's kind of, they saw it as being like contradictory to the Tawheed of Allah. So they said the Qur'an is a creation. Allah created the Qur'an, just like created everything else. But this, all the ulama and the scholars, based on their own evidences, they said, no, this could not be right. Imam Ahmad took that firm stance. No, the Qur'an is kalamullah. Because in the verses of Qur'an, when the Qur'an refers to itself, it's the kalam of Allah. Allah never refers to the Qur'an as a creation. Um, and so there's deep philosophical issues here. So. You know, someone asked Bukhari about that. So, and his answer kind of led people to believe that Bukhari thought the Quran was created. So they they started start to spread this this about Imam Bukhari. Oh, he has bad, he has wrong beliefs. He's deviant. They called him deviant. And then Dhuhli, um, for some reason, pounced on that. He started saying, "Yeah, you should leave his circles." And he started saying people, telling people not to attend the circles of Imam al-Bukhari. Things began to escalate. Then he said, you know, no one should attend his class. First he called him a deviant. Then he said no one should attend his classes. And then, then he started saying, well, it started escalating more and more. More and, people, more, more, more and more people got involved. That's what happens with controversy. Everyone gets involved. And then they make YouTube videos and get more and more likes. And then it, gets, it becomes viral. So it became viral in the version of that time. And then Zohli said, no, this man can't even stay in our town. Kick him out. So he said, it's not only he said he's deviant, then he escalated, said, leave his circle. No one should study with him. Then he said, if anybody studies with him, he can't study with us. And then he said, he can't even stay in this town. And then um, that's the famous incident where Imam Muslim, he stood up and he gave all the books of Zohli back. He said, I'm with him. And he left with Bukhari. 
So Bukhari decided, you know, it's not worth staying here, so he, he left, kind of like an exile, like an exodus. He, so what was the answer? The answer was like, <clears throat> so he said, Afa'aluna makhluka wal fa'aluna min afa'alina. That's one version of the answer he gave. So, you know, and people kept coming the next day, asked the same question to him. And then things got escalated. So more and more people came to Bukhari, started asking him, and then he just got fed up and he left. So in one of the answers, he said, Al Quranu kalamullah ghayru makhlu, wa afa'alu al ibad makhluqa, wal imtahanu bid'ah. And one of his final answers was, Look, the Quran, this is Bukhari's answer to these people keep asking him the same question. The Quran is the word of Allah, the speech of Allah, and is not created. But the actions of his slaves are created. But testing people on that basis is bid'ah. That's not something you should engage in. So Bukhari even wrote, had written a book, Khalq Afa'al al ibad about this issue. Because we believe the Quran says, Wallahu khalaqakum wa ma ta'amalun. Allah creates you and your actions. So our actions are created. We believe our actions are created by Allah, so which is based on the Quran. So, but then, so, you know, Bukhari, like some version of his answers led to that, you know, sense that, you know, maybe he believed the Quran was created. Um, and so many people, they looked at his answers, he said, no, this is a misunderstanding, that's not what he said, because he clearly said again and again, the Quran is uncreated, um, but the words that you, uh, you know, when you recite the Quran, what do you say about that voice? And that's the issue, like that voice that you just recited, like Fuaz led us in Maghrib prayer, his voice, is that created or not, right? See how he, he gets technical, when you start getting into details Things can get misinterpreted. So uh, Ibn Taymiyyah said it best. He said in the long fatwa in Majmul Fatawa, Al Kalamu Kalamu Al Bari was Sautu Sautu Al Qari. That's a beautiful way of saying it. He said the Kalam is the Kalam of Al Bari, the Allah Azza wa Jal. But the voice, Saut, is the Saut of the Qari. So, this, so yeah, you know, what Bukhari obviously meant in his answers, and this is the same thing we all believe. Now look, the voice is your creation, the voice box, the larynx, the voice that articulates Qur'an is a creation. But the kalam of Allah, the Qur'an itself, is uncreated, is, is part of the essence of Allah So anyway, Bukhari was forced to leave, um, and when the situation became out of control, only two people stayed with him, Imam Muslim and one other scholar, Ahmad ibn Salama. And Bukhari then left, and then he's looking for a place to, you know, to go, because like now he has no land, he has no place, he's looking for a place where he could be useful, and towards the end of his life, that's what all great scholars go through, you know, they live their life, do incredible work, and then they always need a place where, you know, they need to retire or continue doing their work, where they're respected, where they can do, still contribute to the ummah, so he decided to go back to Bukhara, so this was in Isfahan, started, uh, decided to go back to Bukhara, now in Bukhara, something else happened. So the governor of Bukhara, Khalil ibn Ahmad, he wrote a letter to him. He said, look, um, I want you to come and be our guest in Bukhara, but teach my children. And so Bukhari replied to him, um, la ilma wa la ahmiluhu ila salatin. In kan, kanat lahu haja ila shay'in minhu fal yahdur li fi masjidi wa fi dari. He said, look, um, I don't humiliate knowledge. I don't go to the doors of the rulers. And put that in perspective of people who do the opposite of that today. So being associated with rulers and governments was a negative thing for Imam Ahmad, for Imam Bukhari, for all the early Muslims. Somehow it became like acceptable over time based on the ijtihad of other scholars. But this is Bukhari's stance. He said, I will never go to the door of a ruler. I do not humiliate knowledge like that. If he wants to learn, he's free to come to my masjid and attend my circles with the rest of my students. But he would not make a separate audience for the rulers. Oh, these are politicians. Let me make separate chairs and honor them like that. When you come to class, you're all equal. That was Bukhari's answer. And it goes on and on. But so... The ruler insisted in another report and said, no, look, just come and teach my children. And he said, look, I cannot ever single out specific people to teach. My classes are always open to everyone. 
and he never taught for money. That's another issue today. So many lessons we can learn from him. All the teachings were free. In fact, these teachers, they spent upon on their students. They never charged. So this is something also new. Not saying any of this is haram. People have ishtihad. But the giants are people like Imam al-Bukhari. There's so much we can learn from them. So this governor then became angry. He said, no, you can't enter Bukhara. So Bukhari wasn't able to enter his own land. So he's kicked out of Isfahan. He cannot enter Bukhara. And then he said, finally what he did was, he retreat, retreated to a small village called Khartank. And this is Khartank, the village of Khartank, um, a few kilometers outside of Bukhara. He had some relatives, distant relatives there. So he spent his last days there and he became ill, looking for a place to go. And he used to pray at night, making dua. And then um, one of the nights he got up and he wanted to leave, but he was so ill. He said, I have to go. So he got on his animal, but then he couldn't, <clears throat> he didn't have the energy. So then he was ill and he lay down and then he died. He died in the year 256 of the Hijri calendar in the village of Khartank. And he died on the night of Eid al-Fitr. Rahimullah Ta'ala. So he was buried in Khartank in simple instructions with three burial cloths. And then his life ended. So this is the life of the great Imam Al Bukhari Muhammad bin Ismail, Rahimahullah Ta'ala. So many lessons from the end of his life. Despite the controversies we went through. In one of the du'as, he said, the earth is made tight upon me, O Allah. I have no place to go. But today, his legacy lives on. We read his al jami al sahih And we want to end on that note that his legacy is alive and well. Um, we read this remarkable book that he wrote, al jami al sahih and I want to end with just what this book is, some concluding lessons on al jam or sahih Any questions about his life before I conclude on the al jam or Anyone? Yeah, go ahead. You can speak up while I'm trying to change the slide here. Uh -huh. His father died early, uh, and did Imam Bukhari come from that wealth family? Yeah, so he inherited a lot of wealth. We mentioned that in life, so so he was able to do what he did because he inherited wealth, which was a great blessing for him. And then he invested his wealth. So he was able to invest, and he had good earnings, so that he was able to do what he did because of all of that. Now I lost my cursor. Any other questions? Just ask me here. Um, well, it's a bit, uh, controversy. How mm -hmm. quickly, what's the time frame you think that sort of episode? Is that over the course of uh, days, weeks, months, or years? Oh, a couple of weeks. Because, uh, well, no, actually, no, a couple of years. Because 250, he entered Isfahan. Um, no, Nishapur, sorry, Nishapur, 250, and he died 256. It's about six years. So, I mean, it was, there was a lot of back and forth, uh, and he was still teaching here and there, but he's the major timeline of events. It's probably about six years. So, Bukhari only taught um, in Arabic. Yeah, so all of these, so the, all these muhaddithin, they were from the Persianate culture, like, um, but there's no evidence they ever spoke in their own language. There's no evidence that they ever... Um, In Bukhara? Yeah, it was Arabic. So Arabic is one of the languages. Oh, they had the local language, but Arabic was the language of people. So there's none of the Muhaddathin have any books written in Farsi. Um, although some of them did speak it, maybe some of them didn't, and there are different relatives of Farsi. There's a fascinating, I mean, 
what fascinates me is like trying to find this cross-cultural references that are related to Farsi and Urdu and Hadith literature. So there's amazing like references that are, uh, I'm trying to compile a list and hopefully we can uh, compile a longer list, but there's there's a Hadith, Ibn Abbas used the word Hazar Sal in a Hadith, in his Tafsir, because, because they're teaching to a Persian society, right? And although they spoke in Arabic, there has to be something that comes out. It's not a lot that comes out, but there's different things that come out, like, you know, in words here and there. So in the, the seed of the verse, Lo yu'ammaru alfa sanatin, these, some of these people wish they could live to a thousand years. So Ibn Abbas in his tafsir, it's like, you people say in your language, hazar sal, zi hazar sal, may you live for a thousand years, may you have nairuz for a thousand years. It was a Persian thing. And now in Urdu, you say, hazar sal means a thousand years. So Ibn, uh, Ibn Abbas used that word. There's also many other examples of, of that. There's a, in Bukhari's life, one of his associates, his name was Mushkudana. There's a muhaddith named Mushkudana. So, and they say the reason for that is he entered the, um, I forgot what hadith scholar he entered. So he said, what, somebody asked him, why do you have that name? Why does everyone call you Mushkudana? So Mushkudana means the seed of musk, dana. Dana Pani in Urdu, Dana means seed, right? Mushkur is musk. It means smell or a good smell. He said, once I entered a Hadith class and I had very good clothes and I had good perfume on and it was so strong. And the Hadith teacher said, Ma anta illa mushkudana. You are nothing but the seed of musk. Like, you, you know, you have the source of the perfume on you. So that laka, you know, people started calling him that. That's a Farsi word, mushkudana. And it's also something you can relate to in Urdu. So there are a lot of, so the answer is like, they didn't speak or teach or write in Persian. There's no Persian literature from this time in Hadith sciences. And it's very interesting why, I don't know. But these references do come out in the Arabic books. But later on, much later, hundreds of years later, a lot of books are written in Persian, Farsi. Shah Waliullah wrote half his books in Persian, half in Arabic. But this is 1100s of the Hijri calendar, almost like, what, a thousand years later? Yeah. Why did he stay back where? Why did he stay in Makkah or Medina? Oh, nobody can answer personal questions like that. Who knows? Allahu alam. He's probably looking that might have been one of the choices, but, you know, when you retire, you generally like to go to where you're from. That could be a strong reason, because in those times, you can't just settle anywhere. It's not, it's very hard to do that. Even today, today, if you just, can you pick up a map and say, oh, I want to live here. Just pick a random place on the other side of the hemisphere. No, everywhere you go, there's so many restrictions. Imagine at that time, there's threat to life and safety. You can't just go and live somewhere. You have to be sponsored. You have to have wilaya with someone. And it was like, you know, even traveling was difficult. It's always been like that, and it still is. So these questions, are, it's like America's asking you, you don't like this country, why don't you go back? <laughs> That's a similar question, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, those are personal choices. Some people choose to settle there. Yeah. SubhanAllah. Um, yes, sister. No, he had no children. So was he married? I don't think he was married. Uh, does anyone know the answer? I have never come across anything about his wife. Yeah, I don't think he was married. No, uh, he he no, he stayed in Nishapur. So he was on. He was alone when he went to Bukhara, and he it was alone when he died. No, Muslim wasn't with him. But he probably accompanied him for some time. No. Yeah. I should. This is leading to, uh, and obviously, one of the things you mentioned was you know, in, uh, to test somebody's a good eye. Because a lot of the young guys, they, they, they like to come and ask me, yeah, but what about his api? This is a very <laughs> common question. I told them you generally judge people on what is apparent. And if you see something, it's a totally different thing. So, yeah. You can, can you use Imam Bukhari? Yeah, definitely. So, Imam Bukhari, remember the. So 
the Sahih al-Bukhari is an extension of the Muatta of Imam Malik. So these are two great Imams. They're the sources of our deen, Imam Malik, Imam Bukhari. So it's something they agreed on. So Imam Malik, there's a famous story. Someone came and asked him, uh, what did they say? Oh, does Allah send his throne? Istiwa ala al-arsh. He said, yes. And he said, how? <laughs> Imam Malik said, what did he say? Uh, Al-Iman, al-istiwa wa ma'loom. Wal imanu bihi wajib. Wal kayf, istiwa wa ma'loom. Wal kayf wa majhul. Wal imanu bihi wajib. Wal suwalu anhu bid'a. So Imam Bukhari said, I mean, Imam Malik said the famous words that look, the way Allah sends his throne is well known. Um, uh, the, no, the ascent of Allah upon the throne is well known. The exact detail in the how the cave is unknown. We have to believe in his wajib, but asking about it and delving into it is bid'ah. And Imam Bukhari said the same thing. He said, you know, like uh, the words of Allah are uncreated, the kalam of Allah is uncreated, our actions are created, and testing people is bid'ah. And today people have made, well not just today, but people have made a whole career out of testing people. So you want to take Imam Malik and Imam Bukhari, or you want to take contemporary scholars that follow that path? It's your choice. It's your choice to make. That's a great principle, imtihan or bid'ah, from Imam Malik and Imam Bukhari. You can't get higher sources than that. Rahimahumullah. Okay, should we move on? It is. Um, yeah. yeah. Want to pass that? Just pass it down. That's a bad habit. You got to get rid of it. <laughs> if you speak in there, because people online can benefit from your wisdom. Particularly, like sometimes I listen to some of the students, it's really wrong. Uh huh. And, and when we listen to them, the majority of their, their, their talks are in Arabic. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. A lot of their talks are in Arabic. Uh -huh. Specifically, when they are discussing um, Islamic sciences, uh -huh. you know, they diverge, of course, into Farsi and. Uh, uh, as they talk among themselves sometimes, but the majority of the overall conversations in terms of text, etc., and what so and so said, and who said this, and who said that, are primarily in Arabic. Um, um, so yeah. I, I just said that to say that you find that because mostly all of those early scientists, that's what they were in, they were in Arabic, they weren't in very, um, yeah. Because they wanted to be read by other scholars. Yeah, so yeah. Not in various parts of the world. Arabic is the lingua franca. It is the language of Islam, the language of our tradition. But, yeah, subhanAllah. Um, I want to move on um, because the most important thing is the conclusion. So, conclusion about Jamia Sahih. This is the final class. And we have to end with some conclusions about the work. There's no better way to end than um, I'll take a a page or a couple of paragraphs from this book for online students. Al-Madkhal Ra'i' ila Sahih al-Bukhari wa ma fihi min asrar wa sana'ir. Shaykh Akram Nadwi wrote this book, an introduction to Sahih al-Bukhari. I started translating and I got sidetracked. It's been quite a while, but I hope to finish it soon. But he wrote a remarkable book about uncovering the secrets of Imam al-Bukhari's Sahih. So this is what he writes in the introduction, the first page of this book. He says, uh, I have never, this is my translation, of, it was written in Arabic. I have never been impressed by any human work as much as I have been with the Sahih of Imam Bukhari. My heart is fully devoted to it with no reservations. I have fallen under his spell in true captivation, swept away entirely. Every time I remember it, my mind recalls the verses immortalized by Shibli Normani in Persian, whose meaning is the following, that illustrious eternal shaper who painted your beautiful marvelous form has not stopped gazing upon you being pleased and delighted. It would appear to me that Imam Bukhari must have compiled a Sahih only to become dazzled by his magnificent mold, his delightful form and his untainted contents. 
To borrow Mutanabbi's word, I found the Sahih more pleasant than aged wine, or the extending of hands for drink, sweeter than the best intoxication. The mercy of morning rain poured forth on those long days spent in devotion to it, and the pure spring of the water of life in the nights. This is a journey of nearly 40 years. I am utterly fascinated and charmed by it, never parting from it ever since I fell in love, nor bidding it farewell. It has a place in my heart which no other human work can replace. My astonishment at its impact and influence does not cease. It has risen far above anything else, even the stars below it. Nothing comes close, no matter how many claims circulate. No achievement impresses me, no matter how many may praise it. In my eyes, the Sahih of Imam Bukhari pales, makes pale in comparison the books of philosophers, wise men, and other Hadith scholars. Those of scholars and literateurs from the East to the West, the compilations of great poets like Ghalib and Dr. Iqbal, and Persian poets like Shadi, Shirazi, and Rumi, and the Arab poets from all period. The Sahih even diminishes the greatest structures like the Taj Mahal, and mighty empires like the Roman, Persian, Umayyad, Abbasid, Ottoman, and Mughal empires. As his companion and captive, I am well pleased and happy. It is for me a fortified bed, and I see nothing that bestows honor on a person other than the Sahih. Just a short glimpse of his description of the Jami or Imam Al Bukhari, Rahimullah Ta'ala. Um, just tells you how great this work is. This is another quote of his. He says, Bukhari Sahih is one of the deepest works in our tradition. The Sahih is full of treasures. Even if I had multiple lifetimes, I don't think I would ever be able to discover all of his treasures. Um, this is a quote from Jonathan Brown in his Hadith book. The finished work was not, mere, was not a mere Hadith collection. It was a massive expression of Al-Bukhari's vision of Islamic law and dogma backed up with Hadith the author felt met the most rigorous standards of authenticity. So I thought it was fitting to end with just a description of the greatness of this remarkable human work compiled by a remarkable imam. And to end with five key facts we need to keep in mind to benefit from the Sahih. So these are all mentioned in this seminar. Just to summarize, just five important facts. Um, you know, I hope you learned from the seminar. I hope <clears throat> you were able to appreciate the depth and the complexity of the science and of this great book. And I hope all of us were sparked to develop a relationship with the Jami Sahih. Um, the first thing you need to keep in mind is that Sahih is much more than a book of Hadith. You know, the Sahih of Imam Bukhari is much more than a book of Hadith. It's as much a book of Tafsir, a book of Fiqh, a book of Aqidah, than as a book of Hadith. So that's the first thing to keep in mind. Many people misunderstand. And if you just look at it as a collection of Hadith, and just Hadith you're supposed to use for your own purposes, um, you're not really, you're missing out on what it really is. Imam Bukhari, you know, he not only gave you hadith, but he also gave you fiqh. He also gave you wisdom. He gave you sunnah. His purpose was to help you understand how to fit hadith into your life. So that's very, very important to keep in mind when you to benefit from the sahih. Number two, I hope you realize that the sahih is a sophisticated and complex work. It's not just, you know, a simple encyclopedia or compilation of facts or reports. It's highly sophisticated. It's a complex work. The way it's organized, the way it's structured. I showed you about the way the hadith are arranged. You know, you have to understand all of these things in order to benefit from the work. And it should make you appreciate the mind, the, the, the genius of, of a man, uh, of the author of such a sophisticated work. Um, also, a great point is you have to begin to recognize the primary corpus of every book of hadith. The primary corpus is the usul. In Arabic, they're called usul. So usul is, you know, like, this is what Imam al-Bukhari intended to share with us. So it's not good practice or good knowledge to share a footnote from a book and say this is what the author said, or to share like a, a accessory report or the supporting report or a hadith that's in the mu'allaqat or the chapter headings with Bukhari adds as a side point and you miss out on the main points. 
So you have to be able to recognize that primary corpus within hadith books because there's so much confusion that results when you don't have that. And I hope you kind of appreciate it to begin to how to do that. At least recognize the concept that there are usul and then there are other things in the work that are not part of the intended primary corpus. Uh, number four, the sahih is for thinkers. This is not a book if you're lazy, you just want answers. Most people, most human beings, they're just looking for answers. They just want to know what to do. If you want that, then you're better off reading the Muatta of Imam Malik or reading another book of Hadith um, that tells you, okay, this is what I need to do when I get up in the morning. This is what I need to do. A lot of people, that's their goal, and there's nothing wrong with that. But the Jamir Sahih was written by an intelligent genius, and it was written for thinkers and serious people. It's not written for um, you know, just the average student. And that is why Bukhari didn't put a muqaddimah, didn't explain his reasoning. And uh, it's very sophisticated, it's very complex. You have to think about everything. To benefit from the Sahih, you have to think. You can't just read it and read a commentary and you got it. No. You've got to think, okay, hey, why is this here? What is this related? Why is, how is that related to this? What is this chapter heading? Why is this hadith here? Why is this isnad here? Why did he use Abu Yaman and not another scholar? So when you start thinking that way, then you can benefit from so much. You can, you know, uncover these secrets. And that's what we're aiming for. Finally, you have to learn how to think holistically, like Imam Bukhari. Holistically means you're able to connect everything with everything else. You recognize that Islam is a holistic whole and everything is interconnected. Every hadith is linked to a verse of the Quran. And that's what the Jama Sahih is. Every chapter that has a relevant verse, the verse comes first. So Imam Bukhari is constantly connecting hadith with Quran, hadith with other hadith, hadith with other teachings. And that's what great thinkers and great scholars, all the great scholars, Ibn Taymiyyah, Shah Waliullah, all the great thinkers and scholars, they were able to connect everything together for you, give you a holistic package. That's how you have to think. If you look at hadith as atomistically, every hadith is a self-sustained unit. This hadith says this, let me derive something from that. And because this hadith, you know, you have to understand the context, the isnad, and you have to understand where the hadith fits. So you have to begin to think holistically and relate everything to everything that you learn. You can't just learn hadith separately, aqidah separately, Quran separately, hadith separately. As serious students, you have to start combining all of those. And that's how you take your knowledge to the next level. And that's what Imam al-Bukhari did with this remarkable work. I pray and hope that all of you benefited. We're able to at least uncover many of these things and at least know your limitations and know what you need to study. You know, from a seminar like this, it's not enough to start being a scholar of Bukhari or start learning Bukhari, but at least it's a step in the right direction. There's so much that I need to learn. We all need to learn. And I hope to continue this journey um, inshallah, Kitab Bad al Wahi is done. Next is Kitab al Iman, and then Kitab al Ilm, and then Kitab al Wudu. So, just those Kitabs just tell you there's a Tarti. What is Imam Bukhari's vision? He's laying the foundations. He laid the foundations for you how revelation began, because revelation is the source of the knowledge. The next important thing he's about to teach you Kitab al Iman, Iman, faith. The most important thing after you recognize revelation is Iman. Nothing more important than that. And after Iman, the most important thing is knowledge. Once you recognize and believe in Allah, then you have to pursue knowledge. Then there's Kitab al-Ilm. Once you get knowledge, then the next step is worship. And worship begins with Kitab al-Wudu, because Wudu is the first thing you learn. So it's a beautiful arrangement. It tells you so much about his vision and what Islam is meant to be, if you think like that. Um, so that concludes our seminar. Uh, inshallah, in the fall, I hope to continue the seminar with Kitab al-Iman and then continuing over the next few years. Um, the next seminar will not be with all of these introductions. Next seminar, we'll just get into the hadith. I'm not going to repeat all of these discussions. Um, this took a lot longer. It was only seven hadith because we need to lay the foundation uh, for such a sophisticated work like this. But inshallah, I hope to see you all again in the fall now you have a break of in august and the pleasure of being here there's nothing better for me than to study and prepare for classes about the jammer sahih 
Um, it's something remarkable. If all of you develop a relationship with that, I pray that we can all do that. And with that, I'll open the floor for questions. Anyone needs to leave? I know it's 11. Uh, feel free to leave, but I'll do the final questions for this class. Speak now or forever hold your peace. <laughs> Online students, I want to acknowledge you and apologize. I'm not always looking at the screen, but I know you're there. And um, if I don't reach out to you or don't hear your questions, I apologize for that. But if you have questions, feel free to type them here in the group chat. OK, just use the mics and keep the mic on if you don't mind. I have to wind up repeating for the online. You mentioned that uh, the book was, uh, the end was not just collection of Hadith, but also uh, of the particular thought process of Imam Bukhari. This came up like during the time when the Malawi were canonized. Okay. So, what is the effect of like, is, is this like the genesis of that Hadith school or what is the. What so, that's a, so, it's a good question. I'll modify your question. The question is about the canonization of the fiqh schools and Imam Bukhari's work. Like, how does that fit in with the schools of fiqh, right? The schools of fiqh. Um, that's a good question. So the brilliance of Imam Bukhari is that today in, in places like Darul Ulum Dioban, they study Sahih Bukhari. Uh, today in places like Medina, they study Sahih Bukhari. In Maliki schools across North Africa, they study Sahih Bukhari. Every group studies Sahih Bukhari from their own angle and lens. So in many places, they use Sahih Bukhari to prove the Hanafi school of thought and the, the rightness of their views. And many places around the world, they use it to support Imam Malik's views. And many places use it to support other views. So that tells you Bukhari's work does not fit in any box. So he was brilliant. He was an independent thinker. He was a mujtahid. So he surpassed like being affiliated with formally with one of the schools and being confined with that. So there are many places where he disagrees and he agrees with the Hanafi school. Many places he'll agree with the Maliki school without mentioning the school because he's looking at evidences. This is a book that surpasses that. It's a book of looking at evidences. And there are many places he disagrees with views that are in some of the Madhaib. So then people write commentaries. So commentary is your way of owning a work, right? So commentaries are written with a different perspective in mind. Sometimes you write a commentary to prove your own viewpoints and to try to disagree with the author. So that happened a lot over time as well. So Bukhari is in fifth views. He's all over the place. He's looking for strongest evidences. So somebody should compile like a, the Bukharian school of his evidences. I was thinking about that, but then I realized somebody did. It's called Jamar Sahih. That's a compilation of his views based on the strongest evidences. His, the Rajim is the Abuab that tells you what he believes in every chapter. And sometimes he references early scholars, Abdullah ibn Mubarak, and scholars of Kufa and, and others, and sometimes he doesn't. But it doesn't fit in a box, so it transcends that. So you're free to engage in Sahil Bukhari as you like. Um, you can learn from him and then make your own decisions. You're free to read it through a comment, through the lens of a commentary. But the problem with commentaries, every commentary is written with, through a different lens that kind of distorts the original work often. So you can't see the original voice, but you only see it through the lens of the commentator. So sometimes it's not healthy to do that. It's, it's healthy sometimes just to read the original itself. You use the commentary to help you, but don't be confined to that. I should like. Sure, uh, I mentioned before, but uh, in the, generally, let's say in the DCC or something, yeah, there's obviously the Mazak, the very similar issues. So well, these classes are recorded and they are on YouTube, I'm so not, just I'm everyone not, should realize it. <laughs> no, just letting you know. No, I know that. Uh, so, if they were to take that approach that he mentioned, they they like to teach on the Tabakhtam, which is a combination of Zahri Muslim and Bukhari, and they explain it. But obviously, there is a, a humbly leaning towards the book. Obviously, I'm not saying every position that they take is that of that school, but 
it's very evident when you did it. Oh, it sounds like I'm feeling that way. Well, the other approach they did, they do is the Lugal Maram, where they take mm -hmm. all the books of Hadith and they, they kind of go through everything. So, the Lugal Maram has mostly Bukhari and Muslim, right? Yeah, the, but they, they take it from the even. Yeah, right. But they they all start if there's Bukhari and Muslim, they all start with those narrations. Yeah, yeah, Bulugh al Maram. You have uh, Ibn Hajar's Fatul al Bari is is a, is one the best commentary, but even their parts like his Shafi'i leanings come out, and you can tell he's going in a Shafi'i direction. Nothing wrong with that, but uh, you have to be aware of that. And then there's purely Hanafi commentary, Sahih al Bukhari. When you read those, you feel like Bukhari was Hanafi. And the whole book is written to support the Hanafi mother. So like, so he was, he could, yeah, you can consider him as that. You can consider him. He was truly belonged to every Muslim. And this book is truly supra madhahib. Like it goes above these schools of thought. Um, Who keeps turning it off? Keep it on. The question I had was, um, so Sahih Bukhari is not really confined to a specific time. Like mm -hmm. It's not, like this, it's just based on the most authentic um, and the most soundest uh, information. So some people who follow a certain mother, mother have, would argue that, yes, this is the most authentic hadith on this topic. However, this was earlier on um, when the Prophet used to do this, and a, a hadith based on action, for example. But later on, there was an action that he continued that is not documented or reported in Sahih Bukhari. And so they would also acknowledge the authenticity of that. Later on, when? I don't understand. Like that. they would say earlier on in his lifetime, he would do a certain action, for example. Mm -hmm. And But later on in his life, he wouldn't do that action. And they would say, well, although this is the most, most authentic idea on this action, but the Prophet did not do this later on in his life. And so. They will authenticate the hadith, but at the same time not follow the action. It's like abrogated, like yeah. kind of like abrogated. So how yeah. would you? Because there's no, there's no uh, timeline in this. Mm -hmm. you know? So how would you navigate to that? So this is Bukhari's conclusions of what he felt. This one, I don't turn it off. Leave it on. This is Bukhari's timeline. Um, is not timeline. This is his, um, his conclusions. So these are timeless sunnas now. Uh, are you free to disagree? Of course. So one of the ways, so when you have conflicting evidence, um, one of the ways of dealing with that, if you have conflicting evidence on one issue from hadith or sunnah, um, one way of dealing with this, look at which is earlier, which is later, and consider it, consider it abrogated. So that's used a lot as a, uh, a device to resolve differences. Um, but the abrogation card is a lazy card. Like that's overplayed in the tradition like abrogation doesn't really exist i mean there is a room for abrogation but the way it's presented in our tradition it's uh overplayed and it's very easy to say there's no proof for that half the time or most of the evidence the instances of abrogation is just because you believe this view is correct so you consider this abrogated by this so the fact is when you really look at it there's a way to understand it beyond abrogation but there's difference of opinion so yeah that those differences will always remain. There are differences among scholars. Some will say, okay, yeah, this hadith is sound, but it's abrogated. But then the burden of proof is on them to prove that. And like, like they might feel that the evidence that they have is strong. And so in the end, you know, these are fiqhi discussions. So Imam Bukhari wasn't infallible, right? Like, so, you know, he, he could be wrong on many issues or some issues. So is there a dispute out there on many issues, specific issues? Of course there is. So Imam Malik's Muatta, for instance, like Imam Muhammad ibn al-Hasan al-Shaybani, the student of Abu Hanifa, he came to Malik, studied the Muatta with him, and he wrote a whole book, Kitab al hujja ala Ahl al-Madina, proof against the people of Medina. So the title is harsher than it really, what it really is. He was a student of Imam Malik, so he agreed with many of their points, but he disagreed with many of the points. So he wrote a whole book on all the Masail, Imam Malik, and where we disagree. And it's a scholarly discussion. It's written fairly well. But these disputes will always be there. On every issue, there's so many like differences among scholars. And one of those have to do with they'll resolve, okay, it's in Bukhari, but it's abrogated. But it's hard to prove abrogation. It's one of those things, how can you prove it's abrogated? 
unless there's a hadith, this is abrogated, but then there would be no issue that this would not have arisen. This case would have already been settled, right? And there's whole, no evidence the Prophet ever said this is no longer, like he used the word abrogated. Allahu alam. Asim bai. Okay, this is the book I carried for you and I busted my back. You didn't even look at it. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah, you're right. I'm just going to say, you know, kind of like eye-opening. But there are no buts. Isn't there an inherent problem in saying that Imam Bukhari or Jamil Tabari was the author of the Hadith? It's more than a book of hadith, it's a book of prayer, and it's more than just some hadiths, because you can introduce an element of bias by saying that and taking away from like pure academic scholarship of this work. Um, you know, because then things like, oh, well, he might have uh, included this hadith because it, it, you know, coincides with his opinion of, of 50 issues and, you know, not included that hadith because he doesn't agree with that position. Yeah, I see where you're going, yeah. So, is there a bias? Yes, there's a bias in this book. It's Imam Bukhari's own work. It represents his views. He's not going to represent other people's views. So there is an inherent bias in every person who writes a book. So surely, Imam Bukhari presented his evidences, what he feels the Sunnah is. So he's not going to present the other evidences, but, but we presume, if you know his life and his work, we presume that he researched every issue and he based on what he felt was strong as evidence, he came to conclusions and he put them in the Sahih. So if that's a bias, of course that's a bias. But could he come up with a conspiracy? Well, he had pre-existing views and he engineered the Hadith reports to include the ones that fit with his views. That's harder to prove. Like, I mean, that's one of those things you can never prove. That's something that you can throw out as an accusation, but it's not academically proven. But look, the burden of proof is on, so the Sahih has been here for a thousand years. In a thousand years, people really haven't made that charge. People have accepted it and it's still like the dominant book today. That tells you something. That means he was sincere and scholars haven't been able to uncover this massive conspiracy on his part to present a certain view of religion. So there's a possibility there, yeah. But that's a... Uh, do you believe in, uh, did you take the COVID vaccine? <laughs> <laughs> no, we don't know of any hadith that met his criteria, which he did not include in the Sahih, even though it met his criteria. He included so, yeah, so that theoretically that category exists, yeah. So, but the thing is, so, Sheikh Hakram's view, and, and not only him, Sheikh Abdullah Arbaid, and many other great contemporary researchers, they say, well, there's nothing that exists that's on its conditions except that it's already in there. But they don't say that just because they like the Sahih. They look based on research. So the research of these scholars from all over the world is that the best hadith that you look at, they're in there. And if they're not in there, when you really look at them, they have defects that precluded him from en entering them in the Sahih. So his inclusions and his exclusions are equally meaningful. So that's the conclusions of researchers. You're free to disagree. There are people that know, like you can disagree. Nobody can stop. This is knowledge, but that's generally the, the thinking on the Sahih of Imam al-Bukhari. So there aren't a whole bunch of hadith outside of the Sahih that have been found to be meeting his conditions that are there. There just isn't. There are people that claim that, but nobody takes them seriously. So the one who claimed that the most, Abu Abdullah al-Hakim. Al-Hakim wrote a whole book, Al-Mustadrak, and all these hadith, there's thousands of hadith there, he says they're on the conditions of Bukhari and Muslim, but they didn't include them. But those hadith are so uh, weak. And so, so he, as a scholar, he was very lax and very weak. And there's a hadith in there about the world created on an ox. The world is resting on the horns of an ox. The ox is standing on a stone. The stone is on the ocean. And every time this, the, the ox moves his horns, there's an earthquake. That's where the earthquakes come from. And he says... Sahih ala shart is Bukhari or Muslim. It's a fabricated hadith. It's a hadith that makes no sense. And Imam Ibn al Qayyim said about this hadith, Wal ajabu man musawwid kutubahum bihadi al hadaynat. He said, I'm so shocked how some people fill their books with these deliriums, fantasies. 
He's talking about Hakim and others. And he claimed this was on the conditions of Bukhari and Muslim, but it's a fabricator hadith. So fact is that there are no clear hadith that should be in there that are, in, that are not in there that people have kind of agreed to. People throw that around because they don't understand Bukhari and Muslim because he's so sophisticated. When you understand him, you realize there cannot be, if you look at the work that he did and Muslim did, it's impossible that there's a hadith they missed. Someone who lived this life, this kind of photographic memory, traveling, type of travels he did around the world, the memorization he had, 600,000 hadith in his mind. How could he have missed a hadith? That's silly. It's impossible. So there's no hadith that's outside of Bukhari and Muslim that should be in there. There might be, I mean, you, there could be a couple, a handful out of hundreds of thousands, maybe there's two or three that someone can make an argument should be in there. You're free to make that argument. But it's nothing that people have agreed upon. So the fact is, it's, it's, not, it's not the case. It's a misunderstanding of their work. Well, um, okay, pass, pass it around. That's the comment of the last one. Last year, uh, I had a friend of mine, and this hacking or something, the mm -hmm. accent. And I wasn't aware, so I wasn't quite uh, there to, to, to defy what he was saying. But he mentioned that we went for a prayer and uh, we said, let's go together. It was a prayer. So it sounds up everything. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, al-hakim, so there's an there's a expression for students of knowledge, la ibrata, bitasheeh al-hakim, wa la al-ijma'a ibn al-munzar. Now, what's the third thing? There are three things that serious students of knowledge don't take. Um, one is the tasheeh of hakim, no one takes that seriously. Number two, the, the ijma' of ibn al-munzar, the Shafi'i scholar, he made a compilation of, you know, I think a hundred or so issues that have ijma of the ummah, and they're all Shafi viewpoints. So it's all the ijma of Shafi scholars, but he made, he called it ijma. Ijma is overplayed. The sahi or the authentication of hadith is overplayed. And then walal wada ibn al jawzi this third one. Ibn al jawzi declared many hadith fabricated when they're not. So his fabrication was overplayed in hand. But these three individuals. So Hakim, no one takes seriously in his authentication, and then these other two for yeah, vice. Yeah. Uh, that last hadith, uh, is that is that the head the head of the companion that is going to? Yeah, yeah. So I think um, what was about that companion? Jibri came in his form, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's the same there. Yeah. And then another question: like that last hadith, how's it related to the black one? Good question. Let's think about that one. What do you think? The hadith is about, what is the hadith about? It's about um, the mission of the Prophet Wasallam, early Islam, and the descriptions of the Prophet and how people were looking for faith and revelation. So, you know, I mean, it's, it's the beginning. He's taking you back to the beginning, the beginning of revelation. So this is a description of the period of time perhaps where people were looking for answers and they knew there's a prophet coming and revelation coming. The prophet means someone who brings revelation, right? So Heraclius and all these people were searching for the new prophet that will bring new revelation. And he is it. So it's like a prophecy of, so if, in that sense, it fits. You have a comment? Yeah, no, it's also just like there are rules for it. You take that and you send it out. Yes, no, but how does it fit with Kitab Bad al Wahi? This is the question. Yeah, yeah, so it's about the Prophet, it's Nubuwa. It's proving his Nubuwa, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, hadith number two, I think, is uh, Warqa bin Nawfal. Khadija took the Prophet to Warqa bin Nawfal and he described or you know what he's going to go through and then he's going to be a prophet and so yeah you know, in that sense it's it's very consistent how revelation started kitab bad el wahi kitab bad el wahi how revelation began No, I know, but the, the contents of the hadith are, what does the hadith prove? That there are all these people 
searching for that prophet that is going to come. So it goes, it's, it's not, Treaty of Hudaybiyah is when the conversation happened, but the contents go beyond the before that. So Heraclius is searching for the prophet who's about to come. So he's talking about the dawn of revelation. So you know, the hadith has to be linked somehow. That does not, it's not fair to say everything in the hadith has to be from that period or linked. But there's a part of the hadith that links you to that, what he wants to prove. But then the hadith is teaching you much more. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, you can. You just took a name, bro. You just dropped the name. <laughs> Yeah, right, uh, right. of some of that hadith. What was the basis of him uh, criticizing them or saying that there might have been some issues with them? Or, uh, yeah, so um, some contemporary scholars, they did criticize a number of hadith and Bukhari and Muslim. So that's today. There was a great Twitter feed uh, by this, uh, this great, um, you know, he's a, a serious student of hadith. He's talking about the, the Twitter feed is about contemporary scholars who weaken some hadith in the Sahihain and their methodological problems. Uh, Abdullah Rabat. So he has a number of books, like he's a serious student of hadith. And uh, so he has a great like feed on that. I'll try to link it so you can see what he lists. So there are methodological problems. There are one of the problems, some of the hadith that are criticized by these people, they're not part of the primary corpus. But they didn't recognize that they weren't in the primary corpus. They're in the supporting corpus, especially the one in Sahih Muslim. Almost all the hadith criticized in Sahih Muslim are in the mutaba'at. So they fail to recognize that and Imam Muslim knew they were weak or weaker. So he put them as supporting, he didn't rely upon them. So that was one issue with that. The other issues would be more than that, methodological. Uh, Darif, I think most of the time it comes out to Darif. Fabricated would be a stretch, like Darif. <laughs> Don't want to take the mic from him. Did he criticize or did he actually read what? The reports? No, he didn't do Bukhari Muslim. Like, so some of these contemporary Muhaddith, they went through all the Hadith literature and tried to reclassify and authenticate Hadith. So they did much more than they took Suyuti's works, they took Bukhari Muslim and others. So they tried to re redo all the Hadith literature. But no one did all the Hadith out there. Like, a lot of people tried. The first person who tried was Imam Suyuti tried to put all the hadith together. And then, uh, but he wound up getting like a percentage. I don't know what the exact, or maybe 60% or, and then other people built upon that. And then other, so it was an Indian scholar, Muttaqi al-Hindi, he wrote Kanzul Ormal. So it's, it's a bigger book. It took uh, Suyuti's work added more. But to this day, there's no one book of hadith that has all the hadith on record. No one has been able to do that. And then people who authenticate, some of them try to authenticate everything out there, but no one has ever been able to do that. It's too daunting of a task. And then you don't need to because everything out there that's authentic is in here. It's, so it's already done. So people don't realize it's done already. Everything highly authentic is in here. But if you want to broaden the umbrella to like fairly authentic and maybe possibly authentic, then there's a scope for add more. Allah on. No sleep today, huh? Okay. Yeah, yeah.
Who was it? Is it Azami? No. Do you know about his work? I don't know much about his work. Mm -hmm. No, if you mention in good light, you can use names. How big is that book? He said 2,000 something. 2,000. So how did that, because Bukhari and Muslim have more than that. No, but anything that's repetitive. Oh, you put it down to one, yeah, okay. Yeah. So if you summarize, then 2,000, 2000 still sounds like a small number, because... Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've heard about his work. I'm not familiar too much, but I heard he did a good job, like trying to compile all the Sahih hadith out there into one volume. But like, so a lot of people are doing this work to like, so there, there are different aspects of that work. Like, so one of the people who's doing it also Mufti Taqi Uthmani. There's the Mudawana project in Pakistan. So it's trying to correlate all the hadith out there, but in one volume. But uh, so everyone does it and everyone has their limitations. And, you know, like look at something as sophisticated as this. Not everyone's going to understand and be on the same wavelength. Like, so when you summarize hadith, sometimes there's four different hadith. You consider them to be similar. So you put them as one. So this is all going to require subjective human scholarship. And that's going to be different for everyone. So it's not going to be agreed upon very hard to produce a complex work that everyone that's free of criticism that everyone will or even a large portion of people accept but except for al-jama sahih and the early mutaqaddimin they had that privilege some of them produce amazing stuff nobody can really criticize today anyone to do that is always going to have limitations Allah a'lam <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. And that's that's his nephew. <laughs> that's the nephew. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Okay, Fatahallahu alaykum jamiran. May Allah bless all of you with many, many victories. May Allah give you a relationship with the Sahih and hope to see you all in this fellow journey soon. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Yeah, so let me stop the recording once again. Yeah, I wanted to just stop in it, but I wanted to stop. Even the pause? Like, what if I pause?